Welcome to Our Town, a 30-minute podcast brought to you by Best Bark Communications, a small but fierce client-centered marketing company powered by decades of experience and well-established business networks. Hi, this is Andy Ockershaus, and this is Our Town, and we are delighted to have a very, very favorite person, someone that I've known for almost 30 years, who's a bulwark of sports writing in America, a very dear friend, Christine Brennan. Andy, it is great to be with you and Janice, who is going to, we'll hear from at some point, right, Janice? She, she did, Thank you, guys. Show. I'm here as a Of course, you're just, you're just the, uh, you're the arm candy. <laughs> but yes, can, it's great to be with you both. Thanks for having me. Really we, appreciate it. We were it. talking about my first encounter with, was a story I heard from the Washington Redskins or somebody on the organization said, the Washington Post has hired somebody from Miami who's going to be the beat writer for our team. And I said, well, what's big about that? He said, it's a woman. <laughs> and I said, oh, my. They, I didn't think they said woman. I think they said it's a girl. Well, and it, I said, we're going to be hearing from something. that. Yeah. And the first time we met was at Jerry, um, Smith's, yeah, Jerry funeral. Smith's funeral. Now, you had 86. been covering the team before right. that, but we hadn't met. But uh, right. you'd met all of our staff and everything. Sure. And I said, this is not a girl. This is a woman. She knows about this business. And from there on, I was a great admirer of everything you did. I know it was not easy for you, but yeah, you came from Miami fun. where you had trouble down there, too, with the guys. Yeah, though not not as much. I mean, we're talking, you know, back in the early 80s. 30 years ago. Well, more than that, 81 is when I started oh at, after God. Northwestern at the Miami Herald. And, you know, there were no cell phones and no answering machines and no DVRs. And I think Rutherford B. Hayes was president. I mean, it seems that long ago. And so, <laughs> I, but I think that's important when, when folks listen to this, Andy, that, you know, we are talking about a different time. And it's there are the thousands world. of women covering sports today and everything is fine. And there's equal access right. in the men's locker room, equal access in the women's locker room for men, male reporters. It's, you know, we're, we're, we're there. We've been there for 30 years. But back in the day, you're absolutely right. So the Miami Herald, I covered the Florida Gators for two seasons and the Miami Hurricanes. I did a lot of Miami Dolphins coverage. And, um, and you know, there was some talk about the locker room, and I wasn't allowed in that Florida Gators football locker room in 81. But here's the deal, and this is why you knew things were changing. Don Shula, the great Don Shula, Andy, almost as great as you. Uh, maybe <laughs> he almost, tried. Almost as old as you. you. Know, he I played know. for the Redskins. Yeah, you know right. That. Oh, I know. There's a whole history there. So Don Shula, one of my heroes, is a girl growing up. Now I'm I'm covering his team, not as the beat writer, but as a backup writer. So I was there a couple times a week and in the locker rooms on Sundays. And what he did, here you've got a devout Catholic. Oh, yeah. Who goes to church every day. Mass. Went to Mass every, every day, day right? So as, as conservative as you would think anyone could be, who in 1980, I believe it was 82, told his players, you're going to wear robes. He issued terry cloth robes to every player. And he said, that's it. Women are allowed in the locker room. If Don Shula could resolve this as simple as that in 1982, why it took some people longer is just amazing to me. But it did. And I also, you know me well, and uh, Miami Herald, my sports editor, Paul Anger, come to the post, sports editor who hires me, of course, my mentor, dear friend to this day, George Solomon. Both of them great, great leaders, 100% support for me doing Absolutely. my job. Absolutely, I know that from George. Absolutely, and George hired many more women, as did Paul, um, and including Sally Jenkins and Liz Clark now, and, and many, many others. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's so many of us, and George right. is just a, a, a leader in that area. So anyway, uh, the when I come up here, and I'm going to start covering, you know, Washington's NFL team, as you know, I think <laughs> the name should change. I think it's just a, a bad racist yeah. name. So uh, find what anyone else thinks. That's my personal preference to not say it. Um, but when I'm starting to cover them, and the Post puts me on the beat, Washington Post puts me on the beat, and all of a sudden Joe Gibbs is saying, well, we don't believe women should be in the locker room. Wow, that was, I was a little sh jarring because I've already been in the Dolphins locker room. I've covered Super Bowls, you know what I'm saying? But I also was so prepared for this from Northwestern undergrad and masters, season tickets with my dad, the Pied Piper with season tickets, the greatest dad in the world with Michigan football, <laughs> University of Toledo football, Detroit Tigers season tickets, Mich Toledo Mud Hens. Uh, you were right in the middle of all this uh, right. in Toledo, right? So I knew sports so well. I was trained at what I believe, biased as I am, is the best journalism school in the country. So, like, I'm not—I'm going to be deterred by someone saying, "No, you can't go in the locker room." No, and of course, I had the Washington Post, and it wasn't just George. We are talking. I walked in the pages of a journalism textbook, right? Where t it's Catherine Graham as the publisher. Ben Bradley is still the editor. Bob Woodward in, is wandering around the hallways doing his great work and writing books. You know, he, you run into him as you're, you know, walking to the cafeteria. Uh, Carl Bernstein would be around on occasion, even though he was no longer there. 
uh, I had the Washington Post behind me. There was nothing that the Post wasn't going to do to make sure there would be equality. Sure enough, Pete Rozelle, the commissioner of the National Football League in 1985, issued an edict saying all teams... This piecemeal aspect of the Dolphins said yes, the Washington said no, other people said yes or no. That had to stop. All NFL teams had to have equal access for female reporters as male reporters to do their jobs, which is what this is all about. Get those quotes, get those comments, and get out of the locker room on deadline. They had to have it be equal. That was 85, and that was right as it I was took put on the beat. four years to get to that point, of course. Well, exactly, but that was the first year I was on the beat. So the moment I was put on the beat... Uh, we never, the cause and effect part was never officially f- figured out. The NFL never said, well, the P- Washington Post is putting a woman on the beat. We have to make this happen. But we all think kind of with a wink that that's <laughs> why it happened. And Pete Rosell, looking to the future, realizing that women were coming out of well, Woodward to cover. Well, you already been covering sports. Exactly. You and, weren't a cub reporter. And the were, NFL. Right. Absolutely. I, that, right. At this point, I'm right now. Tw- the championship team, may I add, in the Miami Dolphins. Right. And then also the Miami Hurricanes. And I was in their locker room. This was college, Andy. And I was in the, the Hurricanes locker room every day, and they go on to win the national title, that first one with Bernie Kosar. So this notion that a woman would be somehow uh, a detriment or subversive or whatever some of these old school thinking coaches thought, <laughs> well, it. hello, the, the Miami Hurricanes were probably the first team to ever allow a woman in the locker room every day from August to January 2nd, and they won the national title. So that kind of took that tells you something. out the window. Um, but then, absolutely, at that point, uh, now I'm in the locker room every day. And I will. let's just, one last thing about Joe Gibbs. Um, I love Joe Gibbs. I love dealing with him. Class act all the way. It was a delight for me. Uh, I think you can make the case the greatest coach in NFL history. I know that's saying a lot. He's got a record that well, proves that. Three Super Bowls, three different quarterbacks. Three different teams. Right. Not a one of those quarterbacks will ever make the Hall of Fame. I understand. Right. That. Yeah, Joe Theismann. Doug Williams. Don't tell Thaisman. And, 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 oh, yeah. It's our secret. Don't tell him. <laughs> Joe, if you're listening, sorry, pal. Um, but Doug Williams and then Mark Rippon. So three different quarterbacks. Not a, one of them is good enough to be in the Hall of Fame. And Joe Gibbs wins Super Bowls with all three, including two strike years. The guy, the coach was amazing. And to deal with, on the record, he'd get mad about something. He'd call me at home. Angry about a headline, I said, Joe, coach, I'd call him coach. You don't, I don't write the headlines. He goes, I know, I know. He said, will you bring that guy that writes the headlines out here one day and let me talk to him? <laughs> you know, like there was one guy writing the headlines. There were yeah. probably 15 people writing headlines. But we'd have this conversation. He'd get angry or upset or bring up the point if he was had something. Some days, he, of course, he was fine. He'd go, what is your thought? He would ask me for my opinion, Andy. I mean, who does that? That's unheard of. Right. Because it's the middle Lombardi of the Lombardi wouldn't do that. No way. They're throwing stuff. See, he's from an old school, too. Right. Yes. Or, George, or George Allen or George something like that. George is the old school. But I was lucky to have this this kind of new age, right. you know, new, new thinking coach. Um, you know, Gibbs, again, very conservative, uh, very religious. but And that's fine. That's totally fine. I don't, whatever. But the point was that he treated me as an equal. And even though he said, I don't want women in the locker room, he treated made sure that I was treated fine. And other than Dexter Manley saying, come on over here, Chris, I got something to show you, which I was like, yeah, right, Dex. And I kept on walking. Um, and that was Dexter. And I never took that seriously. And I never got within 50 feet of him that day um, because you got to be smart and not s- stupid. Exactly right. um, I'm, it's their, their terrain. It's their domain. It's their, you know, I'm on their turf. And Dave Butts with some of his nonsense. But the bottom line was there was never a problem because Joe Gibbs and even good old goofy Jack Ken Cook made sure there would be no problem. That was the class of that organization, and no wonder they won all those. It Super started Bowls. at the top. It sure did, and sure that did. makes a big difference. But that's how great things were. I recall and it worked fine. Being with you at an at, at some affair, the quarterback club or something, <laughs> and you said to me, "We're going to meet Bernie Kosar." I don't think he likes me, <laughs> or something to that effect. Right, that's true. Great memory, and he didn't <laughs> oh, remember. He kept running away from me. I was oh. going to go over to say hi to him, and oh, then he yeah. just kept walking away further. He further. wouldn't want to talk. He got mad because I wrote one thing. In 1983, Touchy. Uh, you can say that again. And uh, 1983, and it wasn't until sometime in the 21st century, I think it was 2005, that we ran into each other, and he apologized profusely. So, like 22 years of not speaking <laughs> over one sentence in a story. Like a child, in, he was in like 1983 a child. In the Miami but, but that's what's so—it's kind of a shame. It's kind of funny now. We're laughing about it, but. 
he was so smart and he was so so um, mature. That's the reason Coach Howard Schnellenberger picked him to be the head, the, the starting quarterback. He's a great in player. He was a great player, unorthodox as heck. You know, he Louis was from Tiant, Ohio. It all worked. Youngstown Boardman. He was you know throwed sideways, kind of like Louis Tian pitching. You know, all, all you know, arms and legs, <laughs> and his head's going another way and whatever. But he was a great. He was a winner. That's what Bernie Kosar was. He was Absolutely. a winner. But he got this in his craw. He was furious with me, <laughs> and he went. So that day, that and we you were knew gonna it was going to happen. I said to you, I said. There's no way he's going to talk to me. So you said, I'll go on and say hi. So I wa- kind of walked towards him and he starts walking away. And if you'd plotted our tracks, it was hilarious because then I moved closer and then he moved farther away. And we like kind of halfway chased each other around the room until I made a full circle. But I said, this is guts. ridiculous. Yet your guts. You oh, faced him. Come on. This is you what, got guts. I, I love what I'm doing. So how can I not uh, go for it in every way possible? Best. We're going to take a break here. <laughs> we have a wonderful time talking to Christine Brennan. And if you've been listening hard, you ain't heard nothing yet. This is Andy Arkertow, and this is Our Town. Hi, Tony Sybil here to tell everybody about our newest restaurant over off New York Avenue. It's called Ivy City Smokehouse, 1356 Oakey Street Northeast, right next to the Heck Company Warehouse. It is terrific, and we have the only seafood smoker in the District of Columbia. So when you go to your grocery stores or your delis, ask for Ivy City Products. 202-529-3300 202-529-3300 or ivycitysmokehouse.com Our Town with Andy Ockershausen Talking to Christine Brennan and Christine, I want to go back to where it all started in Ohio and Toledo and how you got so involved in sports. I've read about it, but it's a great story. Andy, you know, it's I'm very lucky. Um, I had the best dad and, and mom in the world and we have to. Do place, they still live in Toledo? Uh, well, they passed away. They both but, passed away. But um, but yeah, family's still there. Sisters there, brothers. That's there, your roots. Yep, I still own the family home where we grew up in Ottawa Hills. Is that right? Oh yeah. So I would just you know I go the back for Thanksgiving, Christmas, um, when I'm doing some speeches. I do a lot of charity. But work. But you're in a hotbed of sports right well, there in Toledo. Exactly. And but this is in the '60s. And into the early 70s, I graduated high school in '76 when girls were not encouraged to love or play sports. And yet I had a dad, I'm the oldest of four kids, and my dad, who had been a football player in high school in Chicago and then went to Drake and played football for a year in in Des Moines, then went into the Army at the end of World War II, my dad was saying, hey, my daughter wants to play sports, play sports. My mom joked I was born size six X and kept right on growing. I was really tall, <laughs> so I'm the tallest kid in the neighbor. You know, I'm taller than the boys. So they wanted to play sports with me. So every other girl was shooed away. Get out of here. We don't want you to play. And of course, there's no soccer. There's no organized soccer. There's no t-ball. You just in the play. 60s, right? Sure, you just play. The kids, you just play in someone's front yard or down the block or in the field. And so we would just go play at Goddard Field across from the University of Toledo, and I'd be with all the boys, and 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 that was it. And me, I was the only girl, and I was an I was natural. I was I was a good athlete. And so they wanted me. They always picked me first to be part of the baseball team or whatever, as were Mickey Mantle or Al Kaline <laughs> up to bat. And my dad... K-Line Detroit. Yeah, exactly. Close by. And um, and my dad, when I, he always taught, he taught me how to throw the ball properly. The old term, throw like a girl, which we should retire as a nation because now we're <laughs> teaching, of course, all of our daughters to throw the ball properly. So throw <laughs> like a girl is a compliment now uh, with all these millions of girls play, and women playing sports because of Title IX. But the old days, you just made that, you know... In the 60s, girls were pushing the ball. It. Well, my dad wouldn't tolerate that for any of his daughters, much less his son. So, you know, I knew how to fire the ball and throw it, you know, and cock it behind my arm and throw it. And so I never threw like a girl, even though, of course, that term is ridiculous at, at, at now. I don't know if anyone's heard a woman actually ran for president. I don't know. Newsflash. I don't know if you've heard the news. And so, uh, you know, like, <laughs> hello, hello, let's be a, move beyond throw like a girl. And so, but back then, I didn't throw like a girl. And so my dad wanted to play sports with me. And I'm sure, and I've a- I asked him, um, you know, after long after, I said, did, what did the neighbors think? And he said, oh, they probably thought we were the craziest family, that a dad's <laughs> playing catch with his daughter in the front yard. My dad didn't care. He went out and got a bat and ball, you know, more balls, and we were playing baseball in the front yard with all the kids. And everyone, my dad was the, the you know, the biggest kid on the hey. block. And so how lucky was I to have that open-mindedness. Oh, and your mom must have been there, too. Oh, she was totally. right supporting him, right? Absolutely. She was totally for this. Um, and I asked years later, I said, did this bother you? And they said, no, we had this very tall, athletic girl I'm 5'11 and a half now, 
but I was five three and a half in sixth grade. Yeah, but I, over the over the other sixth graders, right? Oh, totally. And then right. by by what sophomore year of high school, junior year of high school, I'm already basically five ten. And by then, I was could play six sports in high school because no one cared enough about girl sports to specialize. Was it a private school? And you went no, to no, public pu- school. No, no, public. It's but a small little beautiful suburban school. Uh, Ottawa Hills would be very much like a McLean or a Bethesda or a Potomac, but a very small village. So, yeah, I know. So, I, I know. What you so, mean. Um, so it was. So I played every sport, but I didn't have any organized team to play on until freshman no. year of high school. Which I say that in speeches now. I do a lot of speaking around the country. And, you know, there's t- so many people are shocked because the girls and the, the young women, and if it's college, I ask them, how many teams did you play on, organized teams, before freshman year of high school? And they're counting up to the 40s, <laughs> right? I mean, my niece today. This is, is today. Right. My niece today is probably, she's a seventh grader. She's probably already had 15 teams, maybe 20, right? Because we're Organizations talking, that helped her. T-ball. Soccer first grade, soccer second grade, soccer third grade, you know, uh, basketball. Now they're travel. playing lacrosse. Girls uh, are really big in lacrosse. Well, again, this is our country. We, if w- girls' sports is just as big as boys', boys sports, and, and certainly in all, and certainly as youth. I'd rather watch it in high school. And so we're giving our daughters, just like our sons, these incredible life lessons well, how to win and lose at a young age. To then to take this sports knowledge and go to journalism school, or did you pick Northwestern because it happens to be one of the best schools in the world? Well, it it, it both actually. I I realized could have gone to UT. I, mean, I could have gone to the University of Toledo. Yeah, I, I chose uh, Toledo. Yeah, but it's no, a fine school, incidentally. Well, sure, it's it's fine. No, I I started to research journalism, and I, and here here's the interesting thing, and I realized about role models. So here I am, maybe the biggest girl jock in. Ohio, maybe in the country, right? <laughs> Just waiting to explode into high school sports by playing, you know, literally tennis and and field hockey in the fall, basketball, volleyball in the winter, and and softball and track and field in the spring. Uh, I also would keep score of an entire season of Toledo Mud Hens baseball off the radio as a ten year old girl. <laughs> Not only was no ten year old girl doing that in America. In the late sixties, early seventies. No, you're no, right. No, no, ten year old boy was doing. No, that. that's correct. So I am totally into sports. I knew exact. I knew sports left and right. We had all these season tickets. I'm playing like crazy. I'm watching like crazy. I'm writing up little reports. Um, my brother's four years younger. He joined me eventually with my mom's typewriter. Anyway, and I never thought I would be a sports writer. Here's why. I never had a role model. I never read a woman's sports byline until there I got to any, Northwestern. There were not. Well, that I knew of. There's no internet, of course. So it's either the Detroit paper, the Toledo paper, the Chicago paper, or vacation, wherever we went. I couldn't wait to grab the sports section, but I never read a woman's sports byline. The only woman I saw, Andy, doing sports on television uh, was Phyllis George, who'd been Miss America 1971. Oh, yes, right. If the career path... Phyllis did, Brown, eventually. Right. But she married the, the governor. Exactly. But, and, of course, Pamela Brown is her wonderful daughter who's on right. CNN and fabulous. And, and She's got her own work. show now, Campbell has. A big show, I understand. Uh, Pamela Brown. 74, they call it. Uh, it's a new show. Yeah, I, I, I... Something new. I just read about it today. So, yeah. Campbell it's, Brown. Right. Well, no. Pamela Brown is... Pamela. It, right. Is, is, is uh, Phyllis's um, well, I'm daughter. I'm sorry. It was Campbell Brown. It's, but, right. So, that led but anyway, you to pick Northwestern well, to do all this research. Well, but again, I'm going to be. A, I thought I'd be a political journalist because if if the if the career path to be on TV as a woman in sports was you had to be Miss America, that was not going to be my career <laughs> you path. You could have won. Well, Miss Ohio. I, I, I you, you, you just go back and look at those pictures from those days, and that is fine because I never relied on my looks. I never. So many women who are beautiful um, think I don't know what they think about the world. But my mom and dad, I was always about substance. I was, mom and dad were always about that, always about achieving and uh, and good grades. And so, yes, Northwestern was a natural for me. When I realized it was the best journalism school in the country, I'm biased. I'm, a, I'm the board of trustees now, so I'm very, very, I'm, I believe purple in all ways. But back then- You could almost commute. Uh, uh, yes, exactly. But back then, um, best journalism school in the country, Chicago, Big Ten, Big Ten sports, I'm there. And I, I got an early decision and that was it. But moving forward and this is something that's very important for any girls and women who are listening to us or boys and men or dads or moms whatever is that because i never relied on my looks i never expected anyone to give me anything that way so i i'm doing you know work it's substance it's it's quality it's achievement it's 
It's newspapers. Well, Substance over form. Yeah, well, now the irony is I'm doing more TV than I've ever done in my life. I don't I, mind saying I'm 58 years old, and I've just had, in, in 2016, more TV appearances than ever before. I have a CNN contract, ABC oh News, PBS NewsHour, the Olympics alone. You still do stuff for ABC occasionally. I, oh, good morning, ESPN, America. ESPN, good morning, Well, not, not ESPN, but, but my big one is CNN now. And I, I did over 50 appearances in Rio and see, thank you, Ryan Lochte, wherever you are, oh, you big goofball. <laughs> and but but the point is, and this is what I tell young women all the time, is is looks come and looks go. So if you are a twenty, and, and I do, t as you know, I do tons of mentoring. I, <coughs> women, I was one of the the first president of the Association for Women in Sports Media. I started a scholarship internship fund. I fund two of those. I'm very much involved with the lives of young women in sports media, college students. So I, I talk to hundreds of them a year. And one of the things is a lot of them want to be sideline reporters. And as I tell them, that's great, fine, I'm, I'm for anyone doing anything. But if you are at age 25 getting hired because you're beautiful and gorgeous and that's fantastic, it's great, I'm all for it. When you're 30, they could <laughs> hire the next 25 year old. They probably got I, her already. Exactly, I want longevity. I want them to be able to say they're doing more television in their 50s than they did in their 20s, 30s, right. and 40s. How is that going to happen? It's by using your brains and your talent. So ironically enough, the story I've just told about not expecting to be getting anything because of my looks and now doing more TV <laughs> this year than I've ever done in my life. At 58. 58. <laughs> and I'm proud to say it. And we can look it up on Wikipedia. My life is an open book, you know, exactly when I was born. So the reality is be honest about that, but also to be honest about this with young women because I want you to be doing this. Exactly. And how in the world is that going to happen if you're being hired for your looks because you're a beautiful young person, which is great, but you, where will you be when you're 50s? You're going to so, take, the, I consider that being beautiful and young a talent, but you got to use that talent by doing other things with and, it. And let's it's just, not going to last very long. And let's be honest, you know, you ran the, the place where we're, we are right now, WMAL, and you've run news organizations and you've run uh, broadcast uh, entities. And I, I'll call out the men, mostly men, who are running these now. If you're just telling a young woman, oh, well, we need you know, look beautiful and wear a cocktail out dress, well, you're doing her no favors. <laughs> so I would put this, and I, I don't mind being controversial, as you well know, I would put this on all these people that run ESPN and all these other networks. What are you doing? Is this a cocktail show, a cocktail hour, or is it a, is it a broadcast? You know, the, everything so, you're saying, I, you I absorb it, I know what you're saying, because I look at these faces and I can't remember one single name or one single thing they said that stuck here. And I watch the shows, I watch the interviews, and they're all the same. I thought they had one person and just keep re-reeling. And I want them to be substantial. Alive. And they are substantial. These young women who are beautiful, I'm all for them. I love, I, I, I'm 100%. They but they couldn't gotta have a do more job. than that. Well, but, and they could. So, because they're smart and they've right. been trained and they've gone to great journalism schools, be it Northwestern or Missouri or Maryland, University of Maryland with our friend George Solomon, my old boss. Syracuse is yeah. a great place. Oh my gosh, there's so many. Florida, USC, they're out there. And these are great, great young people. And don't marginalize them. Don't say, oh, you're just going to be my sideline person. I want to see them in the booth. I want to see them doing play-by-play. -play. We will get there, like anything else, the march of it's, history. It's happening. Oh, it's happening. Inevitable. It's, it's, there's over a 1,000 women covering sports in this country. But it's a it's a real issue, and I, as you know, I'm not afraid to speak out on this topic. <laughs> no, you kept that quiet all these. Well, I, I didn't would never wanna, have known. I know that I was a little shy on that, but oh. I thought I would I would tell you today. But, yeah. but you said, but but 58 years old is not old anymore. 58 Thank you. No, I feel, I feel 25. Great. I'm right. serious. Right. Well, and you're age you're is like only 59 a number. or 60. Yeah, 65. <laughs> Remember, age is only a number. That's right. We're seven years apart. I forgot. <laughs> I oh, use that well, all the time. And that's the point. Let's be honest. Like, I know. Living it. life is great. And, and, and longevity is great. And so here I've covered the Olympics since 1984 in L.A. I just covered my 17th Olympics in a row, winter and summer, Rio. And what a dream that is. I would have hoped to go to one as a fan. You know, 18 and you go to all of them. What would 18 year old me have thought if I, if 58 year old me showed up and said, guess what? You're going to, starting in 84, you're not going to miss another Olympics. <laughs> and you're all expenses paid and paid and TV and new, and the biggest newspaper in the country, USA Today, and before that, The Post. I would have burst into tears at the thought of that as an 18 year old. Like, could this possibly happen to me? So I appreciate all of it. It did. Happen. But also, the longevity is fantastic because. And it's lucky because I, when I'm talking about Ryan Lochte, for example, and that whole ridiculous story and his total you know, misbehavior at age 32, he's not 20, he's 32, and he's lying and he's making stuff up and he's just an embarrassment to the country and the Brazilians and everything. Well, when I'm talking about this, and I know I, I report he's on 
for USA Today and CNN and ABC that he's going to be suspended. And he's going to be suspended um, for 10 months, which I also got that fact out. Um, but I, I'm reporting this because I'm talking to the people. My sources include a whole bunch of people that I've known for 30 years, who've known me for 30 years, who are the people who are going to suspend him. <laughs> so again, if I'm, tw- his mouth. if I'm 25, I'm not, you know, people can guess who those people are. I mean, I'm obviously not going to reveal, but there's a group of 20 or 20, 30 people that were involved with the decision making. Well, because I've been around 30 years, I know those people and they know me, they trust me and they'll tell me what's going on. So that then enhances the credibility. Pro- right. And that enhances my ability to report news. Yeah. A 25 year old who I'm for as much as life itself for her success or his success because I metro so many of them, the 25-year-old doesn't have the contacts. So it's a beautiful exactly. thing, and this is the shame of our news business, whether it's broadcast or, or newspaper or print or, or, or websites, where we're getting rid of all the 50-somethings because their salaries are too big. Well, there goes the longevity to break the news, and that goes over exactly. into politics, and that goes over into coverage of the presidential yeah. election. It goes over into everything, and that's why I feel so lucky and fortunate it's to be where I am. experience. Do you realize that? We could not do what we're doing now, and Janice will tell you that, because I sat down with Janice, I came up with a list of 100 names of people I can call that would respond to me, and that's what I did. And there, nobody refused me to talk about our town as you're talking. This is you are our town to me because you've done so much here. Now, how in the world did you run into Michael? He, he was in college. Wilburn, you Wilburn. knew him in Northwestern. Oh, yes. yes. So we were. I thought Michael's we, a lot older than you. Well, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, shall we uh, continue take the Michael break, story? And we'll talk about Michael Wilburn and all the great writers you've worked with, and talk about Augusta and all of that that we've been through. This is Andy Ockershausen in our town with Christine Brennan. This is Sonny Jorgensen. I got a confession to make. I let my wife drag me to one of those Mike Collins estate planning seminars. Like I don't have enough on my plate with a certain football team. Actually, it wasn't too bad. In fact, we both learned a whole lot about how to protect our kids and grandkids down the road and to take care of ourselves right now. So if you get one of Mike's invitations in the mail, go. I'm glad I did. Get all the information and register online at MikeCollins.com. That's MikeCollins.com. You're listening to Our Town with Andy Ockershausen. Brought to you by Best Bark Communications. We're uh, with uh, Christine Brennan. This is Our Town, Andy Ockershausen. We're talking about the, the posties, but mainly I'm talking about Michael Wilburn, who you knew in college. Absolutely. We met first day freshman year. Can you picture? Too bad we didn't I have iPhones. I thought he was a lot older than, <laughs> than you. I'll be happy to tell him that when I, I see him. I will when I see him. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, I'm, a, I'm six months older than he is. Wow. I'm a May birthday. He's in November. So... Uh, so first day freshman year, you go to the journalism meetings. There are 150 freshmen in, in the Medill School. According to this journalism course? Yeah, well, just the journalism school, Medill School right. of Journalism. So there's 600 total, 150 in each class. So 150 of us. And there were those of us who, I, I guess, checked off a box about sports. I, you know, I barely remember. <laughs> so we go to this meeting with this, with this professor who's going to be our advisor for the ones who like sports. Even though, again, I'm still thinking I'll end up being a political reporter only because I, I had no role models. In sports, right? Well, I, I didn't. Did women do who? this? Although, then I get to Northwestern and I read a woman's sports byline. The sports editor of the Daily Northwestern, Helene oh. Elliott, L.A. Times to this day, uh, was there, and I read her byline. I said, "Oh, okay, women can do this." But um, so then I was on my way. Is she the editor or just the sports editor? She was the sports editor, uh, the, but she was had a byline. The school in, paper. Yes, the Daily Northwestern, where I ended up working and becoming. Was it a the daily? Manager. They did it Northwestern. Oh, yeah, Monday through Friday. Sure. Wow. And I was the managing editor and, and news editor. I mean, I with I, advertising. I may. Add. Oh, it's fabulous. Yeah, <laughs> fabulous. And no, and it was our it was our life. You know, it's my <laughs> sure. um, boyfriend senior year was the editor. I was the managing editor. I mean, we all you know, it's like my friend, best friends to this day. Many of them. But so and Will Bond was part of that. He was the sports columnist. Anyway, so freshman year, first day, it's too bad we don't have like, uh, you know, pictures of this, of all of us little <laughs> kids. It was a little, a little ridiculous. But um, I meet him and uh, others, of course, that day. And we're off and running on this friendship that has lasted from September of 76 to this minute. Um, and uh, a great story. I think plus years. It is. And 
Uh, so, dear friends, through college, again, he was a sports columnist. I was the managing editor. Um, you know, just uh, pals all the way through. Well, then he gets the Washington Post internship and goes, well, I get the Miami Herald, and he comes to the Post, and then he's full-time at the Washington Post. And we would stay in touch. We'd see each other at bowl, right. bowl games, Maybe. you know, just as 22, 23-year-olds, whatever. And now it's that Miami hurricane season at, as they win and keep winning and uh, lost their first game and then won Who every game. Who was the game. coach, Jimmy Johnson? No, that was Howard Schnellenberger. Oh, yeah. And they're well actually done. now in the Orange Bowl. And this is the game to, um, you know, for the Orange Bowl for the national championship, Miami against Nebraska, Bernie Kosar, whatever. Unbeknownst to me... Mike Wilbon is taking the entire week's worth of Miami Herald sports sections, which I'm breaking news and I'm the beat writer, so it's all over the, uh, you know, I'm lucky enough to be all over that newspaper every day with my, my stories. He's putting them all in his suitcase and he brings them up to George Solomon and he dumps them on George's <laughs> desk and says, here's my friend, Chris Brennan or Christine Brennan, whatever you would have said, hire my friend. Wow. And eight months later, I'm walking in the door of the Washington Post <laughs> as its newest sports writer in, in 84. So that is literally, I, I tell that story and Wilbon and I laugh about it, but I, how many students and, friend, and, and young people have I told that story to, Andy, about how it happens? Would I have made it to the Post anyway? Maybe. I mean, I was hearing from people, uh, well, Boston yeah, Globe. you were not unknown in Miami, obviously. And I was lucky enough, even though there's no internet back then, people, the word is right. out and people, you know, let's, I want to also be honest here. If I had been a white male coming out of Northwestern with the exact undergrad and master's from Medill. Uh, if I had been a white male, I would not have gotten that job at the Miami Herald because they put me right on the Florida Gator speed. I, I passed over maybe 10, 10 people who were kind of waiting because they'd never had a woman sports writer and before. And they were going to go make a step. Well, they were going to make, make a, a step. Statement. And I was a token. For the first and only time, I was a minority. I'm a suburban white kid from Toledo. I was a minority. But I also accepted that responsibility. Um, you know, that first day was at Momentus. I, I was trying to figure out where to park and what elevator to get in and come <laughs> up to my momentous. desk. Yeah. But this I also, a even at age 22 back then, I, I realized I, I was willing to accept that. I didn't take it as pressure. I took it as I was so confident, so strong. My dad always said, "You're stand up straight, shoulders back." Who knew he was going to prepare me to walk into men's locker rooms? A great newspaper. But, I mean, this is not rinky dink. No, it's and, Miami Herald. And a lot of in South America, everybody in South of Miami reads that paper in well, the islands. And it was the biggest paper in Florida. It was what top ten newspaper in the country. In the country, absolutely. Northwestern had a great tie. So I had about thirty college friends that were down there in various roles bureaus and etc right. but for me to go right to that major beat because again at the time in miami there's no major league baseball there's no nba and there's no nhl it's the miami dolphins and then it's florida florida state and miami so i was put on that beat but i think that is important to say to folks that i i, I get it as bad you know like there were there hardships for women yeah but actually it was great being a woman because a great I, opportunity if I'd you. been a man, I would not have gotten well, that job. And I well, and also that. you know, well, I've said that ten thousand times over my career. So, so because Michael I'll be was a, also a minority. He faced that in his career growing up. But at the post, it was not a problem to anybody. Well, at the again, post, well, and George Solomon and Ben Bradley and Len Downey and Catherine Graham were all about. Uh, diversity. diversity because it worked it, it made a better paper well, of course that's it what did. they were after and, but that's a perfect and even example to hire tony <laughs> yes <laughs> i'll let Who you say diversity. The diversity i say it to him all the time right. but but again wilbon embraced it i embraced it sally jenkins well we embrace it and then we we also don't even think about it no right? that's natural because that's now. the point and you know janice you're here you know as a woman leading you know in in, in management and whatever you, you don't want to be the woman manager or the woman sports journalist, you're the sports journalist who happens to be a woman the same way, right? Don't right, you but feel you have way? to feel special. When you walked into those situations, you had to feel special. You had to feel like, man, I am, I've arrived. Well, I'm and, 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 well and you know you are. Like, um, you know, I, I must admit there'd be times when people would say, oh, you're the only woman in this press box. And I didn't notice it because I was focused on what I was doing. I, <laughs> you're watching you know, the game. Right. Yeah. And so if a camera crew yeah. was following me to do a feature on me, okay, because I would say yes to that because I'd picture a seven-year-old girl on the couch in Bethesda or Southeast I, DC or Herndon and I've heard and I've heard from those seven year olds who are now 45 or whatever who were inspired you know or, or who do remember Absolutely. me which which makes me smile because I said yes to those interviews not because I wanted publicity frankly as you were calling Carlisle you know I'm being followed by a camera crew that was you know kind of uh, kind of uh, inhibiting you know what I mean I'm, I'm trying to do my job and I've got a crew in my face so they're interviewing me not the, not, the, not the, player. the players but that's what they do well they did because everyone <laughs> 
you know, said, four. Woman. What is she thinking? Yeah, four, five, seven, and nine all did features on me when I was put on the beat in 85. And happened to be six feet tall. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I accepted and that shoes. gratefully because I realized, okay, I, I, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'll bring it, you know, take you know, bring it on. I'll, I'll, Good for I'll, you. I'll, it's not a burden. It's a joy. It's a great responsibility. But it is. But I, again, was raised by parents who were like, honey, you're going to be noticed and yeah. tall and whatever and be confident and comfortable. And who knows where that confidence came from. But well, it, but I had it and I, so I feel much. very lucky. And great for the Washington Post. And George knows that. because George is a very dear friend. All those years growing up, I knew George when he worked for the news. He worked for the Daily News, <laughs> which at one time was a very good little Washington newspaper. And George, George is very foresighted. Now, one of the things I noticed that you got deeply involved in, and I was a part of that with you, but only that much, was Augusta National Golf Club. I recall one day in Augusta, I took Christine on a tour. We walked around the golf course with a guy named sure. Yvonne Lendl. Yes. Was one of the great tennis players in the world. He well, knew less about golf than you did. But he knows now because here. he has daughters Many, playing right. golf. Which he is became again, a world class guy these, in golf. These male athletes who have female, uh, who have girls, who make the their girls into fabulous right. athletes. And the tour's making a lot of money for them, too. Well, salaries are up and, and the gates are up and uh, the pot's up. But anyway, you got into a, somewhat of a conflict with the mm -hmm. the elders at Augusta National. Yeah, which right. And I supported you all the way because it had to be the stupidest thing in the world. Well, 1999 was the first year I went there. And I just asked a question. It was the end. And, and people like think, oh, there's some mission or cause. It's a good I, question. Know, right. So it, it's the Hootie Johnson press conference, and oh, everyone's yeah. asking about the tree on 12 and the, <laughs> the well, not the tree on 12, the, new the tree trap. on 13, and the, yeah, you move the bunker on 14, <laughs> and, you know, all this stuff. So I'm wading through all the golf questions. All these guys are dear friends of mine, and, and reporters are great, so I'm not going to barge in. I waited towards the end of that press conference, and I just said, uh, Hootie, I'd just like to ask, um, you know, do you have any women members uh, and uh, do you have any African-American members or how many African-American members, how many women members do you have? And he said, that's a club matter, ma'am, and all club matters are private. <laughs> well, as a journalist, Journalism 101, you follow up. Do you have any women members? You know, I, I realize because come on, that's a club matter, ma'am, and all club matters are private. Well, I quoted him verbatim. Now, none of us told our name. It wasn't like a presidential press conference where you're being called no, on with the name. So I would, of course, said my name, but no one else is saying their name. Hey, Hootie, hey, hey, hey. So it wasn't a stealth question. It was, I mean, anyone on earth could have figured out who I am. Uh, I mean, I'm <laughs> sitting right there. So the next day, I quoted him verbatim in USA Today, the Ooh. largest newspaper in the country, because of course I did, because of course I'm a columnist for USA Today. Hello. <laughs> That's why you were there. That's why I'm there. That's what I'm doing. This is not a secret. Uh, it has been uh, well documented that I am. That's what I do. And that, sure enough, up comes Hootie with the PR man into the press section and where we're all sitting, and he introduces himself. And, uh, you know, I think they were a little surprised to make this, to have this be quoted. Well, they weren't saying they were misquoted. Of course they were. They were quoted accurately. Right. He was. But he just wanted to say hi. And so I took the opportunity. I said, why don't you have a woman member? Well, we will in due time, he said. Well, do it. Why not do it sooner? I mean, we're having a great conversation. He was a great guy. People, what, what people yeah. don't realize is if whenever I would see Hootie at Augusta, he'd come up and give me a hug. People wanted this to be the evil feminazi, <laughs> who, by the exactly, way, is a, a yeah, came from a, the Rock Road Republican household. That always shocks everybody. My dad was Bush's vice chair in Ohio in 88, and we had all these presidential candidates at our house. And I know George Herbert Walker Bush well because of my dad to this day. And, you know, that I was some kind of liberal crazed maniac. No, um, this is the exact opposite. But they wanted to make it like I'm the terrible, awful woman against Hootie. No, we got along fine. I was asking a question, yeah. and Hootie he answered the question. The rules are the rules. Hootie is just one guy. The rules of the club, not Hootie. Exactly. And but he, who was he followed by? Well, that's Billy Payne. And we knew that Billy would make the change because Billy ran the Atlanta Olympics, Olympics. in 1996. And he's a little more forward thinking. Oh, yeah, I was born a little more recently. <laughs> and so Billy, who I've known since 80, the late 80s, because it was his dream to have the Atlanta Olympics, and I was covering the Olympics for the Washington Post. So I was down there all the time. And the fact, Washington Post still... Clout, clout, clout. It, well, exactly. In fact, Billy and I got along so well, he gave me a big story. He wanted to bring golf to Augusta National for the 96 Olympics. And he said to me at that time, we'll show all those old geezers at Augusta what it's like to have women and people of color from all around the world playing golf. 
That was Billy, well before he was a member right. of Augusta and well before he was chairman of Augusta. Cool. So I knew that. And I was able to quote him on that when he was still dancing around the issue and looking ridiculous and embarrassing himself when he was trying to you know, twist himself into a pretzel to explain why women were not members of Augusta. And it was, uh, thankfully, and it was 2012, I got, right, I got back from London, the Olympics. I was out in San Diego giving a speech and I got a call, not from Billy, but from someone, allowing me to break the news. So here I am, their biggest tormentor from 99 <laughs> to 12. And they also- uh, They because, came to you first with. Right, because- That's class. Well, it's class. And it's also because of hopefully the way I treated them and they right. treated me, they knew what they were getting. And I was allowed to break the story. And again, most people out there, and we saw this with this election, this awful, awful, nasty, terrible behavior, not only by one candidate, but also by all of the internet. Um, and this is what people just need to stop and think. And I, I don't mean to make political statements, but I mean, it was Donald Trump, of course, and the awful things he said and did. And, and then all these people that foment this, right? And again, whether you voted for him or not, he was awful, officially awful and disgusting in his behavior. So, okay, so there's that. Well, people don't step back. I mean, you can have a disagreement as I did with Augusta for 13 years and also be incredibly civil, polite, get along and be friendly. And that's what that story proves. Uh, and I'm very proud of that story. And Billy Payne would not have been president of Augusta National if he hadn't done a good job with the Olympics. I think that was a springboard, don't you? I, we, put him into that job. Great point, Andy. And as you know, the 1996 Olympics were known as the Women's Olympics. Absolutely. It's where softball started. It's where women's soccer started, which I'll led never to Mia Hamm, Muhammad which led Ali. to 99. Jan and of course, Janet Evans is the one that's passing the flame to Muhammad Ali as what he's shaking. A fabulous, fabulous show. There was so much going on in those Olympics, but it's known as the Women's Olympics. Not one, but two women's pro basketball leagues came from the Atlanta Olympics. WNBA and American Basketball League, I think it was Whatever called. Whatever it's called. And that, then that folded. But the WNBA to this right. day. Women's soccer grew from that. So Billy Payne oversaw the greatest Olympics for women ever. So there was no doubt in my mind that eventually Billy Payne he was going to, was to going be bringing women because it was so opposite of Billy that he would not, that he would be overseeing this club that was so discriminatory against women in the 21st century when he in the 1990s led the way in a big way with women in sports. And you used to always drive me crazy about the good brothers, the good old boys. All of them went back to their own country clubs after Augusta National and played with their wives at their club. Or the ba or the, or the young women who were hitting the ball farther than they were. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> right. And I mean that's the thing. I mean that, they, we, they if they we really want to get it. women they were screwed up. Well, it was idiotic. And of course, the, then they bring in two women. Now there's a third. And one of them is Condoleezza Rice, who's the most famous member of the club. I mean, who wants to hang, who doesn't want to hang out with Condoleezza Rice, right? I mean, she was, of course, uh, George W. Bush's Secretary of State. Who wouldn't want to play a round of golf with the Secretary of State during W's Everything. Term? And that's Connie the point. Connie was there. That's the point. And yes, Connie. Hillary Clinton did not win this election. But folks... Anyone who doesn't think that women are not equal players, I believe, uh, what, four In women? Life. Yeah, it, four women were elected to the Senate. There were six new senators, U.S. senators. Four women, two men. So we have more male spouses in this new class of senators than female spouses. Four How about to two. That, Hollywood? Right. So, hello, it's 2016. So, this, I, I hope if there's any. What, the last three guys who hate Title IX are probably in Montana hiding under a desk right now? And, and you know, like, come on out, because it's 2016, and if you cheered for the Olympics, if you turned on the Olympics for one second, right, and you love the Katie Ledecky, and you love the U.S. Olympic team, oh, wow. well, then you are the biggest fan of Title IX, because if there's no Title IX, then they the U.S. didn't, that didn't the, happen. Well, then the U.S. is third or fourth in the medal count. Because well, our, we don't I have the women your who are the ice great skating athletes. coverage too. When we talk about that, but you knew that my friend Ron Townsend mm. from Channel Nine was a member of Augusta. National. Well, and I and I know Ron, and he we're friendly now. Right. I don't think he was entirely pleased that no, I don't uh, think that so I either, was asking but. those questions. But I would say back to Ron, who I like a lot. I mean, Ron is an African American. who's the first African American member of Augusta That's National. That's correct. It is interesting to me, in all honesty. Here we are. Who cares? It doesn't matter anymore. Um, it, it's probably, I've always tried to be honest. He got in way before Connie Rice got in. Well, and it, did he do everything in his power as an African American man to bring women in? No, of course not. Not. And let's just be honest. It's a male thing, it's not color. Well, Christine, this is great. I want to come back and talk to you about the ice skating, because that was another one of your coups. As I recall, this is our town, Andy Ockershaus and Christine Brennan.
This is Andy Ockershausen talking to Tommy Giacomo and bragging about his restaurant, The Palm. Hi, I'm Tommy Giacomo. Why don't you come down and see me at The Palm Restaurant? I've been there for 43 years. We have great steaks, great lobsters, great food. Caricatures on the wall. It's just a fun place to eat and drink. We're located at 19th and N, just below DuPont Circle. For reservations, call 202-293-9091. That's 202-293-9091. www.thepalm.com. This is Andy Ocker's house, this is Our Town, and Christine Brennan it was one of the great stories of all time as you covering the uh, Olympic a uh, problem between the two female skaters, world-class skaters, incident, whose husband of one I knew, Solomon, right Jay here Solomon. from ProServe. Sure. Yeah, Nancy Kerrigan, Tanya Harding. What a January story. 1994, I went all the way to the end of and February. still with the Post. I was with the Post at the time. And um, that story, it's, it's my favorite story to ever cover. Everyone thinks, oh gosh, you know, Ray Rice, which of course is a very different kind of story, or Jerry Sandusky, very different kind of story, terrible, or whatever these st things are, nothing ever will approach <laughs> Tanya Nancy. Uh, it was just the story, Bill, of course, the attack of one skater on her knee, a, a bruised knee that spurred Nancy Kerrigan on to the greatest performance of her life. At, at the end of the day, we're talking about a bruised knee. Um, but it looked really bad for a while. And of course, the, the four goofballs that attacked her, the game that couldn't shoot straight, were all friends of Tanya Harding or her ex-husband, her live-in ex-husband. You can't beat that, live-in ex-husband. <laughs> Tanya was a Tanya was a chain-smoking asthmatic. Think about it for a minute, chain-smoking asthmatic. And so, you know, with you just- high, With a high-profile sports job. Right, skating. With, trying to skate. Wonder why she never won an Olympic <laughs> medal. Hmm, let's oh. think about that. <laughs> and, you know, so you just had this unbelievable storyline that was very important and very serious the nation took seriously a one of washington post day after day oh, yeah. leading the network news that's when i started doing a ton of television All the time. i didn't have contracts so i was literally doing the today show and good morning america and nbc nightly news <laughs> and abc and nightline and everything else and it was fun i mean i really uh, npr morning edition i just that's when i really started to it was almost do, an incredulous story like oh, the game. cnn i mean this is and this was cnn's first big story this was our first kind of cable tv right. story where people would talk about it at the grocery store and in the frozen and it wasn't food. a sports story there was a criminal story it right? was criminal but it was all figure skating Those sports, these beautiful ice yeah. princesses uh-huh they're competitive whoa so you threw that in the mix and and uh, it all led, the other thing about this story that most people don't realize, it all built, it built and built and built day after day <laughs> to the moment where they skated against each other, the short program in Lillehammer, I think it was February 22nd or 23rd of 1994. That story to this day, that, that night of figure skating on CBS, CBS had the Olympics back then from Lillehammer, Norway, sixth yeah. highest rated show in television history, history today, to this day. Last MASH, number one, Who Shot JR, Dallas, number two. One of the episodes of Roots, number three. Two Super Bowls involving the 49ers, four and five. Tanya Nancy, short program in Lillehammer. Amazing. And it will never be topped. Now there's more viewership of the Super Bowl. But there are more channels now, right, 48.5 rating. Half the nation watched. It was eight hours old. Everyone knew the result. Still half the nation watched. The Super Bowl get a 40. This got a 48.5. Again, more TVs now. We have never seen anything like it. And so what happens then is I've covered every minute of it. They skate. Nancy wins the silver. Tanya finishes, I think, what, sixth and ends up throwing up in a trash can. You know, she's got her skate lace thing. Everyone remembers that, pointing to the skate lace. You know, it's just an unmitigated disaster for Tanya Harding after all that. And Nancy wins the silver. Should have won the gold, I thought, against Oksana Bayul. And off they go. Well, a few months later, a book editor, I'd written one book on, with Tracy Austin, uh, the tennis star, and Lisa Drew from Scribner gets in touch, Andy, and says, um, you know, have any ideas for books? I loved your coverage of, of all the Tanya Nancy stuff. And I kind of, well, I don't know, no one's ever done a journalistic look at this sport that the TV ratings are, again, obviously through the roof. And so I put together a book proposal that became Inside Edge. Uh, I thought my other colleagues, Andy, I thought the Chicago Tribune and the and Boston Globe and all, everybody would jump in to do a book. No one did. So I'm only there by myself writing I have the book deal. Well, you lived it. I lived it, but they did too. Well, what true. I'm saying is so many other journalists covered it, but I was the only one. So again, kids out there, go for it. Go for it. I didn't even know what I was doing. I mean, I knew I'd written a book, or, but I kind of like blank slate. And I put together this book, which was funny. The judges, the skating con con the costumes, Katerina Vitt, Peggy Fleming, and the woman who was second, and how their lives changed because of the oh, decimal man. point back in the early 60s. 
HIV AIDS, the tremendous sad loss of life of the men in the sport at the time when no one was focusing on age, AIDS and HIV. Way, way before that. Yeah, I the mean, 90s. Dick Button. Right. Well, he's, you know, he's fine. He doesn't have, but, but Dick, of course, is the announcer. That was the age, though, when he was announcing all Exactly. That. Exactly. But, um, and he's still alive and fine. But, but all these creative, wonderful minds in the sport, skaters, Olympic gold medalists, uh, coaches, choreographers, all dead because of AIDS. So I did that, a chapter on that. And the book went through the roof and became a bestseller. And I left the post when I got the next book deal that reflected the success of Inside Edge. And, you know, who knew that a serious journalist would say this, Andy, but I will. Right here on your podcast, Tanya Harding changed my life. How about that? Our town. <laughs> One of the wonderful things about covering sports, you, you live it, you became a part of it, and now it's helped you in so many ways. But that's why I saved this for the end of our conversation, because I know how important that is to you. <laughs> and it's, I know how important it is to, to journalism. That book said a lot. That you can you can do it and you did it and and I thought it was so fair to everybody, you know you were dealing with uh, idiots it seemed to me. Oh, there was a lot of that, <laughs> and, and that hasn't stopped as we know. There's some of that, but how lucky are we? And I, I you know, I know we're at a close here, but the, the the finish. But you know, I've never worked a day in my life. I mean, I am doing yeah. what I love, and for the young people out there, boys and girls, men, women, whatever, who are thinking about life and and what they'd like to do, you know, if you do what you love. As you know, Andy, oh and Janice, you know, you never work a day in your life. And yeah, there are moments, of course, uh, but you know, the highs to, and lows. To, get to go to around the world covering sports what and TV and, and and speeches and books, I'm living my dreams, and I'm so lucky. I just feel so fortunate. Well, Christine, you're a shining example to men as well as women. If you work hard, you get lucky. You know, and luck follows speed, and you're fast, and you do everything right. And we're so delighted to have you in our town. You live in our town. You're part of our town. And I don't know anybody who doesn't love Christine Brennan. Oh, well, Andy, I, I feel the same Especially, about you. <laughs> yeah, I think everyone loves you. And Janice, of course. <laughs> Janice. Is, of course they do. They Janice all love does. Janice. I, Andy, you know, I don't know. No, but adore Christine, you. Thanks special. for all you've done. You pushed for me. You you had me on the air here. You were a huge supporter of my career. Comcast, we've done it all. Absolutely, Christine. but thanks for the support. I, it well, would, would not have done, been possible without people like you. Again, you. what you did way back 30 years ago with the Redskins impressed me and impresses me to, to this day. And you stuck it out and you dealt with all these people and dealt with them as, as a friend. And that's what it's all about. Christine, thank you. This has been Our Town. You've been listening to Our Town Season 1 with your host, Andy Ockershausen. New Our Town podcast episodes are released each Tuesday and Thursday. We welcome your comments and suggestions on how you like the show or who you'd like to hear from next. Catch us on Facebook at Our Town DC or visit our website at OurTownDC.com. Our special thanks to WMAL Radio in Washington, D.C. for hosting our podcasts.